off the music before I get copyrighted or whatever the word is. Okay. If y'all could not tell by now, I am trembling. I am sweating out my ass cheeks. And I am, I, I think I'm so nervous just because the people that are gracing us with their presence today means so very fucking much to me. Like they're, they continue to share knowledge with me, even though like we haven't spoken so long. <laughs> I haven't spoken with these people in so long, but they are cont a continual light for me in this world. And I am just so thankful to just, just to say that I know them. Ooh, if you are new here, hello. My name is Kay Stroll. My pronouns are they, them. And I've been practicing saying this all week without crying. And I know I'm not gonna be able to do it today. But today is the 100th episode of Absolutely Not. If you are new here, you probably have no clue why I'm crying. But if you have been here, the reason is you. The reason I am crying right now is because of you, because of the love and support you have shown me through all of these episodes. I am able to say that sentence and cry about it. <laughs> so I am so grateful. There's a few specific people I do want to shout out who have consistently supported this space. And when I say support, I mean financially, baby. Um, and those people are Joe Cardillo, they, them, KM Jones, they, them, Mateo Cleary, he, him, Megan Griffin, she, they, Rebecca, Becky, Le Leendo, she, her, Coley Woyak, she, they, and Anna Moya, she, her. These people send me money so consistently and I'm able to continue to provide this space for people, this community, and have the services available here. Okay, let me. I truly did not think that I would get here. And so, yeah, we fucking did it. Yeah. <laughs> there are amazing people here to share their insight with, with myself and all of you today. And I'm excited to be able to introduce them to you all. The first person is Sharon Hurley Hall, she, her. She is an active, she is an anti-racism activist, educator, and in-demand speaker. Firmly committed to doing her part to eliminate racism, she is the founder and curator-in-chief of Sharon's anti-racism newsletter. In her newsletter, Sharon writes about existing while Black and majority white spaces and amplifies the voices of other anti-racism activists. Sharon is also the co-founder of Mission Equality and the Introvert Sisters podcast and the author of I'm Tired of Racism and Exploring Shadism. Sharon, thank you so much for being here. The next amazing individual is Brittany Janae She Her. She is a Black woman and mother, consultant, writer, podcast host, speaker, and advocate for equity, justice, and radical self-love. She is a self-described perpetual wanderer, learner, and unlearner committed to being possibility for what it means to show up as her most liberated self. Her work includes the creation of liberated love notes and the founding of loving accountability, of in loving accountability. Excuse me. Thank you, Brit Brittany, for being here. Ooh, excuse me. The next amazing panelist is Lisa Hurley, she, her. Lisa is an Anthem Award-winning activist, speaker, and writer whose work focuses on racism, introversion, and Black joy. Ms. Hurley is the co-founder of the Introvert Sisters podcast. If y'all did not know, they are sisters and the host of Real Talk on Racism. A noted voice on LinkedIn, she is ranked in the top 20 of 
to Plio's 100 best LinkedIn influencers and in Favicon top 10 LinkedIn creator in inclusion and diversity worldwide. Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. And last but definitely not least, excuse me, is Kimberly John Morgan, she, her. Kimberly is a formally trained career counselor and experienced Black workforce act advocate, excuse me. Through her private practice, Juncture Consulting, Kimberly unapologetic unapologetically calls out workplace discrimination in all of its forms. By way of equity, education, workshops, Black-centered conversations, and her exclusive content space, The Salt Box, Kimberly exp explicates normalized biases and readily challenges the status quo. With 20 years of experience supporting historically included populations and a lifetime of being Black, Kimberly educates clients worldwide about the discrimination that hides in plain sight. Thank you, Kimberly, for being here. Okay, I'm just gonna take like 17 breaths real quick and then we will move on with the program. Each of these amazing intellectual giants will be asked several questions today and they'll be sharing their insight with all of us. I'm so grateful for them being here today. Um, do you have anything to share with us before we get into the questioning part? You know, I always have something to say. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much for creating this space. You know, like none of us would be here if you had not created this space. And so I'm so happy that there are 100 episodes to celebrate. And I hope that I just want to celebrate you. For, for doing this journey and bringing us all along. Um, and so I just thank you for, for just being you. And I was going to save this for later, but I want to share it right now is you were one of the first people who I engaged with on LinkedIn when I first started posting like two, three years ago. And the kindness that you gave me, I was just like, okay, I, I can make, there's space for me here. So just know that as much as, you know, we hope that we've given you, you've given us so much. You've given me so much. So thank you. Can I add to that? Because I think yours was one of the first podcasts that I actually guested on. And the way that you set up that space really raised the bar for me in terms of how I wanted to show up. And, and Lisa, I, I know we'll probably say the same in terms of how we would want to get ourselves organized. And just that warm and welcoming space that you created. And I, you know, yours is one of the voices that I really value. So, you know, congratulations, Kay, on this huge milestone and happy to be in your house again. And um, I will echo everything that has that has been said. I mean, hey, you you are one of my OG connections on, on uh, and, and friends on LinkedIn. And, you know, it feels like in the LinkedIn world, we go way back. And you have always just been so warm and welcoming and consistent not just consistent in the way consistent in showing up and in the way that you show up uh you have never wavered from your your at least at least us we don't know what's going on behind the scenes but in terms of what we can see you have never wavered in your purpose in how you show up in how you hold space and Definitely agree with what Sharon said. I mean, I, she and I have had many conversations about, oh, well, this is how Kay does it. <laughs> this is the onboarding sequence. This is how things are managed. Um, this is how boundaries are set and, and, and space is made. And so congratulations. Thank you for being you and sending you enough, enough love, as we would say about home, sending you enough love. So um, I'm affirming all the love that has been shared up until this point. Uh, in a world where social media gives us access to talk about and speak of our values and the thing that means something to us, it may be feeling like a whole nother thing when you bear witness to folks embodying them. And just some like real, 
tangible human ways. And that's what you'd be given, Kay. And I love that. I love that for us. I love that for community. I pulled just a few seconds ago <clears throat> um, a love note just to like see what would come, right? And lo and behold, I am not deficient. I am not inadequate. I am enough. I am everything. And if I don't say nothing else, this entire hour, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna affirm that and um, hope that deep, deep down inside, um, you believe that and know that for yourself. Okay, we'll just wrap it up. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I hate it here. <laughs> but you love it. But you I love, love it here. here. I love it here. I love it here. here. You love it here. Um, this is this is community. This is love. This is what the work looks like. The reason that these emotions overflow from me is because this is me. This this isn't a podcast that I'm just like putting out there in order to make money or what have you. This is me. These experiences that are shared in this space mean something to me. Um, and I would not be here without these shared stories and experiences. Um, I am holding on because of them and with them. Oh, let me stop talking because I don't have enough tissues. Just, I just got this drag cleaned. <laughs> the first question I have for the panelists today goes to Kimberly John Morgan. Um, I'd love to know, are we allowed to choose our allies? Oh, when you asked me that question, I, I wrote a whole dissertation. Um, and so I'm gonna try to give you my concise version, which is absolutely, absolutely. We need to choose, you know, our allies. We need to choose who's in our corner. We need to choose who's in our house. You know, society would have us believe that we're supposed to just take whatever comes up and shows up at our front door, to which I say, absolutely not. Absolutely not, pun intended. Um, no, we need to actually choose who's in our life, who holds space with us, how much space do they hold? Because energy is a finite resource and you don't wanna be pouring it into spaces that cannot appreciate who you are, do not create safety for you, or we'll just use it for ill-gotten gain. Right, So we have a responsibility to ourselves to choose who our allies are. We have to choose who we bestow that title upon. And lots of people would like to darken our doorways and say, yes, I'm an ally. They're not, they're not. You don't get to call yourself that. You don't get to call yourself that. As much as I advocate for you know, people who face isms or whatever, I do not call myself an ally. I need somebody to call me that, and that is, high praise. That is high praise. Because that means that you have demonstrated that you have the capability of holding space and offering protection and offering support to somebody who lives differently than you do, who looks and lives differently than you do. And people would just love to say that they're an ally for whatever marginalized group, because it sounds good. It sounds pretty. It sounds nice, right? Because what's the opposite, right? Because if we're looking at binary thinking, right? Binary thinking says you either you're this or you're that. So if you're not, you know, um, anti-racist, then you're racist. If you're not an ally, then you're racist. Like there's, there's no middle ground. So of course, everyone's going to sign up and say, yes, I'm an ally. Because nobody wants to sign up and say, yes, I'm racist. No one's going to say that. So the, the responsibility is on the people who are marginalized to decide who they call an ally and who holds space for them and who allows them to just be without expecting anything in return, you know, because that's the other thing with, with allyship and whatnot is like, you have to be able to give without expecting the gold star, 
without expecting, you know, the big thank you and the big social media post on, oh my gosh, look how this person, how no, you just need to be able to give it and keep going. And you're giving because you know, it's the right space to pour into. And you just, you just are giving that so that person can live a better life. You know, they can enjoy doing what they're doing and they can be freer. So long answer to a short question. Um, yes, we do need to choose who our allies are. Uh, we have to be decisive about that. Um, and we also have to recognize that there are limitations on that. And so one of the things that I'm working on, and I will shamelessly plug myself, um, is one of the things I'm working on, it's going to be in Saltbox probably the next two weeks or so, is how do you assess who's an ally? Right? We had all the people that show up and say that they wanted to be allies in 2020, you know, and people want to be allies for intersecting identities. Everyone wants to show up, but how are we vetting them? How are we vetting them? So I'm going to, I'm starting to vet people and it's up to me to decide who gets to be in my circle. And if they don't like it, well then too bad. So yes, we do get to choose. Thank you so much for sharing that answer. One of the things I wrote, I mean, I wrote it down several things. I will continue to write down several things throughout this panel, but uh, I boxed this in. It says, give it and keep going. So many people give the allyship and then like money, please, or something, mm -hmm. please. Like I mm -hmm. expect something in return. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be my measurement from here on out is, did this person give and keep going or did they give and then stand there with their hand out? Yes. Like, okay, now dub me a black ally, dub me a queer ally. I just, right? First of all, I they want the selfie, do right? Like, so I'm not giving you the selfie. I got to keep it moving. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> now we all learned that in this, that allyship looks like give it and keep moving. Thank you so much, Kimberly. That's You're welcome. Thank you so much. And the next question I have for our panelists today is for Sharon. Um, why did you build your own table? Many of us here have built our own tables. Let's look, let me acknowledge that. Why did you build your own, own table? And why are you encouraging others to do the same? Thank you. Thank you, Kay. I mean, I did it because we can't expect, we can't wait for breadcrumbs. We cannot wait for breadcrumbs. Let me start there. We can't wait for breadcrumbs. I think so many of these platforms that we're on, so many of these spaces that have been created have not been created with us in mind. They don't always welcome us. They don't always treat us as we deserve, give us respect, give us, a, you know, enable us to feel a sense of belonging. You know, so often we are, we are trolled, we are gaslit, we are you know, we experience racism, we experience harm in all sorts of ways. And also in trying to raise the issues that matter to us, you know, for people that, fight, that, that face isms, um, in particular um, racism, anti-blackness and so on, we get suppressed. And so my thinking is, and also we don't own those platforms, which means as much as we complain about it, they're in their right to say, hey, we don't want your stuff here, right? They're allowed to do that. It's their platform. They own it, right? Now, true, we make our pla those platforms what they are and they would be much poorer without us, but we are not actually the ones holding the purse strings. So if we want spaces where we can speak our truth unvarnished, unfettered, then we have to, we have to build our own table for that. And, you know, and so I did that because I realized that my content was being suppressed, my words were being suppressed. There were, I knew that there were people that wanted to hear what I had to say, but they weren't getting to get the message because on different social media platforms, I mean, a lot of us are on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is by far, is not the only offender at all, at all, right? In fact, my first suppression was on Facebook, which is part of the reason why I'm no longer there, right? Um, we have to create our own spaces. Now, you know, my, my thing is, if I am paying to rent this space, you know, if like, I, I publish on Substack, they get their 10% of my paid thing. So technically I own that space, I own the domain name, I can export the content, I can recreate it anywhere else. They do not own me. And, you know, 
as a black woman, that feels good not to be owned, I can tell you, <laughs> right? And not to have people thinking that they have the right to own you and suppress you. So there's that. And so that is why I also encourage people to do the same. And I've done this for a long time. This is not something that has started happening in 2020. When I was working as a freelancer, which I did for 17 years, I said to people, always have your own website. Don't build your business on a social media platform, right? So this is a consistent message that I've been giving. And I think it's more important when you're talking about um, anti-racism, social justice, racial justice, DEI, because we all know the backlash has already come, right? We all know that that is there. We all know that many of us are finding it hard to get traction and visibility. But when you have your own house, your own space, and people can subscribe to you directly, and you have their email address and they have yours, then there is no gatekeeper. There is no gatekeeper. You can be unfiltered, unfettered, free. You can get the messages to the people that need to have them. So yeah, um, that's why I did it. That's why I continue to do it. That's why I continue to recommend it. And I mean, I know many people here can attest that whenever I jump into these conversations, that's what I say. Do you have your own space? Should you create your own space? How are you creating your own space? I know, Kimberly, we had that conversation way back before you did Saltbox. You know, by all means, every we have all had that conversation. I think I've had that conversation with several people who are on this call. We need to create our own spaces. We need to own our own spaces. And that enables us, I know I'm taking up a lot of time, to also make space for other people, which is one of the things. That's why I have a Building Your Own Table series in my newsletter so that I can feature people who are also doing that, who are redressing inequities, who are making space for others to thrive, who are lifting as they climb. Because all of that is wrapped up in this idea of building your own table. It's not like we're not building our own table to leave people sitting on the floor like some people right? We're building our own table with seats for all of us, right? With space for all of us to be our full selves. That was a long answer to a short question too. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, even just in your wording, how you put that out in your newsletter said like, these are the people that are building their own table. You are encouraging other people to do the same and you are encouraging other people to do that type of expansion to make sure that they're lifting other people up. The thing that I wrote down here is, um, do you have your own website? There is this other content creator. Her name is Christina Heath. She, her, and I, that was one of the first things she told me. She said, you spend $700 a year on your website and nobody goes to it. Like I spent a lot of money on my website and to have it not connected to shit. That, that, no, that's, <laughs> Where is the money going? I'm just giving out money. Oh, what's up, Chris? Um, but yeah, that you're just giving away money. And I'm I'm not doing that anymore. My money is going to me and the people that I love. That's where my money is going. So thank you so much, Sharon, for constantly reiterating that to me whenever I get your newsletter. Thank you so much. The next question I have is for Brittany Janae. Brittany, you talk about this often, but why can't I tie all of my worth to my work? So, um, so I was thinking of like short answer and then like, I also wanted to contextualize the, con the initial conversation like we had around this. And so short answer, I am not my work. Um, we deserve better right? We deserve to be regarded in more, from my perspective, divine and humane ways. And sometimes resistance in an anti-Black colonial violence system lives in how we see ourselves and like clarity in, in who we are, right? That's like my, my short answer. And in K, I was trying to remember like exactly when we recorded that episode, like I'm not my work. I went into the crates because I'm trying to think through like, what was my context? So much has changed. So much has changed in just like life. Um, and it was like August, September, 2021. Um, yeah, I am not my work. Who knew? Who knew? Perhaps God and the ancestors, but who knew that like six, maybe seven months later, 
that I would actually be leaving my job, <laughs> um, my work, a role that I had become <clears throat> so accustomed to, right? A, a role that I was so uh, like, just like proud of, and that was so just like interconnected um, <clears throat> in or with my identity. And so in as much as I am not my work was a affirmation or liberated love note that I wrote to myself in 2020, 2021, I'm experiencing it today as like divine provision, right? As this sort of like softening that was necessary in order for that transition to be what it was for me. Um, I remember a time when I only knew myself as Brittany J. Harris, Vice President, Learning and Innovation at the Winters Group. Like I remember a time where I only understood um, my interests and my worthiness through the extent to which I was able to produce and have a response to something and facilitate here and speak there and be sort of like known and regarded on this list and that list. Um, and so in hindsight, and invite, you know, folks, and you know, a lot of my work is very much so um, unapologetically connected to my love for Black folks, invite community to really consider like what an intrapersonal reckoning could look like, you know, for you, um, for us, as we contend with the ways in which systems like show up and how we see ourselves. I'm thinking about like validation even. I'm thinking about how um, common and like natural it is to like yearn for validation. And at the time, I'm recalling that a lot of my yearning for validation was around my work and wanting to be seen. And if I'm being really, really honest, and I feel like I can talk about this now because I've done a beautiful work with my therapist. Um, I remember um, at the time really yearning for validation from someone who I considered, and maybe we can all relate to this, someone who I considered, you know, mentor, um, elder, my elder. One of the things my therapist helped me process, and I felt like it was a mic drop, Jim, is that just because someone is an elder doesn't necessarily make them your elder. And so a lot of times our expectations can really be misplaced. Um, and we can like put ourselves in positions to be like disappointed. And so I was actually able to retroactively level set mine in the spirit of love and accountability once I came to that understanding. All that to say that a lot of that val um, validation was what can I do to feel seen, regarded as worthy, seen as valuable, make them proud, um, and I've been thinking about how limiting it is, how limiting and a disservice it is if the only way I consider myself worthy of my elders or ancestors' pride is through work. You know what I mean? Like how much, how limiting it is if the only way I see myself deserving um, is through, you know, what I'm doing or producing. Not only is it a disservice to my humanity and my inherent worth, but certainly in some cases to their vision, right? And that's why you got to have clarity around who your elders are, right? Because I think about how enough in the spirit of that love note I read to you earlier was my grandfather's now an ancestor, his favorite one, and how enough I felt in his presence. And um, they have nothing to do with what is on my resume, my LinkedIn, 
or you know who I'm in front of and engaging with in the work capacity and how we are so deserving of that. You know what I mean? So I'll wrap it up by just um, affirming that, long story short, I wholeheartedly believe that we deserve to come to know and understand ourselves in just more like nuanced humanity serving and loving ways. And the extent to which I'm able to like calibrate and recalibrate myself is literally in response to the question, like, who are you? You know what I mean? Like when I complete the phrase, I am, you know, sometimes I, I just, I, I journal on that just to see how grounded, you know, I'm feeling. Cause there's so much that can go behind that dot dot besides what I'm doing out in these streets, right? Um, so yeah, I am not my work. It's still alive and well. And um, a practice, right? A practice, an ongoing, ongoing practice. I cannot. Like I, I knew this panel was gonna be shitty for me. I really didn't know. I, I really knew all the questions that I wrote and I wrote these a while ago, just like that. And I knew they were gonna hit me right in the fucking chest. I knew, I knew. And I still let y'all answer them. Like, why would you do that? Oh, um, I'm going through a transition currently in more ways than one. Um, even with absolutely not like, the, my funds ain't there. I'm asking for funds because the funds in there. And I had to ask myself the question last week, what would happen if I could no longer do this? If I could no longer have this space, how would I continue to do what I want to do? The, how would I continue to get that message out there? And I am not my work. I am not this space. Like I am me. I, I Through any mm -hmm. medium, through any way, I'm going to be able to do this people are going to be able to hear me and so mm -hmm. timely they know Brittany Brittany <laughs> the answers should be known I, I really fucking hate that <laughs> but thank you so much for your answer because it was needed for me and I hope for everyone who's here today deep breath Lisa Ooh, as a fellow crybaby and introvert um I just love that your work constantly gives permission for us to be so. And so the question that I'm asking you today is how much, like, how, are we even allowed to be introverted? Are we allowed to be crybabies? How much of us are we allowed to be while doing this work? Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> You know, you already got me started. I mean, thank goodness, thank goodness for these sunglasses. <laughs> the tears are already beginning to, to well up. Um, you know, I've been, I've been criticized, whether it is, you know, personally, professionally, wherever, for, for being a crybaby, um, being, you know, having all the emotions all the time, um, sometimes being too quiet, sometimes being too loud. And it just, there comes a time where you just have to know this is who, when you're filling out, like Brittany said, when you're completing, I am, right? Those are, yeah, so I am a crybaby. And yes, I am an absolute introvert. Like if there is a sliding scale of introversion, I am on the, whatever is the deepest, farthest <laughs> corner of it. And then, and then off the cliff, that's where I am. Uh, and so no, no matter what it might appear like, um, Everything that I do is 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 a lift for me, right? Uh, be because of the introversion, I'm just I'm just keeping it real and being hundred percent truthful. Uh, however, yes, one can be extremely introverted, like I am, and still you can still show up and show out and do the work and do the 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 podcasts, you know, appear on podcasts, do the TV shows, do all the things, and what keeps me focused and centered really is my sense of purpose and to tie back into what Brittany said at least this is a, a a relation that I'm seeing a connection that I'm seeing 
is that I am, I am definitely not my work. I'm 100% aligned with that. However, I, I, for me, I am uh, my purpose. So at least that, that's part of one of the, that's one of the ways that I would complete that, that, uh, that prompt. And so purpose is what undergirds everything that I do. So three years ago, when I started writing and posting more frequently on LinkedIn, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't to, to, you know, build a following and get accolades and whatever, you know, like I, I didn't even know if anybody is like, okay, I'm going to post this stuff. Is it going to go out into the ether? But you know, there was so much going on. Um, George Floyd was murdered and everything that accompanied that um, horrendous uh, act of terrorism. Um, and so I got to the point where I felt I cannot just stay silent, sit by the, sit on the sidelines and not do anything. Uh, you know, Kimberly mentioned when she spoke about, uh, about people sh showing up. And yes, we want, we want allies to show up and, and they absolutely have to. And yes, uh, also agree that they can't call themselves allies. So we have to call them allies. But we too have to show up if we're really serious about doing this work. And we have to show up whether, whether your post gets one like or a thousand. I know, and I, I know this apply. All of us here probably have exp <laughs> experienced that. And this is, this is probably literal, right? It can be, you can get a one like post. but but it touched one person. It touched that one person. And so that is what keeps me, keeps me going. The, the, the sense of purpose really is my North star. And so when the, uh, when the introversion and all the other accompanying, you know, there's <laughs> the introversion, I have anxiety, I have a, a brain injury, I'm autistic, and I'm not mentioning those. Those are not um negatives let me be clear they're just they they just are right um but in their existence <laughs> with within me uh things can sometimes feel feel challenging but the, the the sense of purpose that that is it um and in addition to focusing on purpose i also this will come as no surprise Kay, because we spoke about this when we did our episode our episode together um i do set firm boundaries and firm boundaries can look like uh, asking for questions before an interview for example and I've, I've turned down many I mean you you are one of the people again people that you know are you're an exemplar for many of us you just provide them a lot of people don't do that right um, and so yes I will ask for questions before an interview it looks like also carving out time and space to recover after <laughs> I am sure we mentioned at the at the top of this that most if not all of us uh, in the on panel are introverts and I can pretty much guarantee unless we have like meetings immediately afterwards <laughs> there is going to be recover right we're <laughs> after this <laughs> after this we're here with love and after this we're like okay we need recovery time doesn't mean we don't want to be here is just how we're we're sort of set up and how how we function and so carving out those boundaries as an act of self-care and self-love and being unapologetic and knowing that look um what is for you will never pass you right and so sometimes after right what is for you will never pass you and all money is not good money those are two two th listen <laughs> now, I believe in being paid, but it has to it has to be right. It has to be right. And so absolutely, there are times where I have turned down um you know, I've turned down opportunities or as I call them full full opportunities. And every now and then I wonder, eh, did I have said no to that? And then I remember, okay, what is your North Star? What is your purpose? What are you really trying to achieve? Because it's actually not about being on every podcast. It's not about being on every show, right? I choose very, very carefully who I collaborate with, who and when and why and why. I, I choose that very, very carefully. And um, because there has to be an alignment 
there has to be an alignment. If all the other bells and whistles and accolades and, and you know, platform growth and sales of products and services and all that happens, that is wonderful, right? But for me, it is about purpose and alignment, right? And I'm grateful that people, in, very grateful that people interact with my content. But like I said, that's not why I started and it's not why I continue. Um, I actually, I'll share that I had yesterday one of the best days that I have had in literal years. I, I actually called my, my, I actually called my mom and said, this was such an amazing day. And do you know what made it an amazing day? Some, some, some things happened, right? But what made it an amazing day is that I actually, I felt well and healthy and energetic. And my brain was clear for the first time, literally in years no exaggeration I'm, I'm tearing up now right and just and I, I share that to say that I'm, I'm sure a lot a lot of us go through stuff you're, there's always something in life that you're going through but still all of us here probably all if not most of us in the audience we show up we're consistent right despite how we might be feeling despite the energetic drain despite the the, the pull on your your internal fortitude and resources because it is about purpose it is about purpose and so uh yes you can be introverted and introverted and neurodivergent and autistic and freaking constantly exhausted <laughs> and feeling unwell and still show up and do this work and do it at a high level right because one more time it's about purpose Thank you so much, Lisa. I hope that's permission that everyone needs to show up. And no, I'm not, I'm not even gonna touch on that, but um, there's just so much about this panel that I love. More importantly, what I love is that you are all black women. Black women are the most disrespected people in America, honestly, the entire world, like the most disrespected people. And so because of that, they are at the center of my work most often. Um, the question I have for the entire panel to answer is, are Black women allowed to set boundaries? Kimberly, I'd love to hear your answer first. Again, another dissertation. Um, let me refer to my notes and give you the short version. Um, like you said, Black women have historically been the most disrespected people on the planet. We've been objectified, we have been copied, we've been emulated, but we never get the credit for, for being the original, for being the blueprint, right? And that's problematic. And so um, and I know why this question is phrased in this way, because it's kind of facetious, right? Um, Black women, whether people want to allow me or not, boundaries will be put in place moving forward, you know, because it needs to happen. And it throws people off because for so long, it's been normalized for us to not have any boundaries because we haven't had autonomy to our bodies. We haven't had autonomy to our ideas. We haven't been allowed to make the money off of the things that we create. We haven't been given that. And so when we just to say, if we, when we decide to say, yeah, hell no, no, boss, you're going to pay me. Um, it throws people off. They're just like, but what do you mean? You've been giving it to us for free. I haven't been giving you nothing for free. You've been taking stuff for free. You've been taking stuff for free. I'm gonna try not to swear, but you know, people have been taking stuff for free for too damn long and enough is enough. And so we need to have those boundaries in place. And, you know, to all of the black women out there who are creating something, who are creating houses of their own, you know, whatever your house is, um, the one advice that I would give to people, you know, Black women who are out there setting those boundaries is be prepared for people to fall off. People are going to fall off. People will take it for free as long as they can take it, right? They will line up and take it for free. But the minute you translate that into you have to pay me for my ideas, for my time, for my energy, for how I show up in this world, for access to me, people just lose their minds. They lose it, right? And I'm just gonna give myself as an example because uh, I know myself better than anyone on the planet. Um, when I translated from LinkedIn to my own space, to my own house, 
I thought for sure, people are gonna come, no problem, no problem. And I have at this point, like 6,500 followers on LinkedIn, right? When I started off in 2020, I had like under 500 and I've grown it to like 6,000. All those 6,000 people will gladly eat from my table for free. But when I translate it into a paid space, I have less than a hundred people who are in my house. And part of that is attrition in terms of, you know, maybe not everyone deserves a seat at my table. That's fine. Um, but it's also because people don't want to respect the boundary. They want, they want to eat from my table for free. And I'm like, no, if I want to eat as a human being, like physically eat, go to the grocery store and be able to buy food to put on my actual table, you need to, you need to pay, you know, because I drop gems regularly, regular in my sleep. Right. And so that is the power that Black women have, that Indigenous women have. And we need to own it instead of having it just be a free-for-all where people just take it for free and they take one bite and they throw it away. It's like, no, 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 boss. You need to, you need to switch it up. And so long, again, long answer to a short question, Black women need to have the boundaries in place because otherwise we're going to be used up, worn out, so tired and worn out. And, and you see this in the health epidemics that are out there, right? We have black women who are young, you know, we have black women dying in their forties and fifties. No boss, I'm not going out like that. I am not going out like that. No, absolutely not. And so my boundaries are up because I'm just like, I know the value of what I bring to the table. And if you want to eat from said table, you got to pay for it. You have to respect it. You have to know that there's, there are limits as to the, the level of access that you have for me, uh, have to me. And the other thing I want to say on boundaries is that, you know, and relating it to allyship, allyship is not all access. Let's not get it twisted. You know, I posted about this last week. It didn't do so well because I don't think people like the message, but I don't care. Um, allyship is not all access. So just because you align yourself as an ally because you've established a practice to support, you know, the, the identities that I have that are marginalized doesn't mean that you can come traipse all through my house, come put up your foot in my bed and eat out of my fridge. Like you can eat what's on the table, but you can't go through my cupboards. Like you don't have all access to me. And I think people get that twisted. And so when black women put in those boundaries, we're told that we're angry, we're hostile, we're difficult, we're this, we're whatever. But it's like, no, everybody else can do it. Our boundaries are okay for everybody else. And I can't go to Mr. Corporate Whiteman's house and go traipsing through his house. He'll call security on my ass, right? So why can't I have boundaries in my own house? Why can't I have boundaries in my own life? And so for... You know, Black women especially, put up your boundaries and you're going to have people who fall off, people who aren't going to love you, people who are going to say that you're difficult and say all, no, 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 all the things, all the things. Let them say all the things. Because the thing is, is that the trash will always take itself out. So when they take themselves out of your, your circle, then I give thanks. I give thanks. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for not exposing me to any more of you and for making your way out the door. And so now I have room for people at my table who actually want to be there. So yes, we do need boundaries and we don't have to be worrying about who doesn't like it or not, because I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but I'm someone's ting or Milo. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So that's, that's my answer to that question. Thank you, Kimberly. Sharon, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Kate. Well, I just want to endorse everything that Isha and Kimberly have said about the necessity for having boundaries. It's something that we don't do enough. You know, we're trained, we're trained first as women and then as Black women, right? There's, there's levels and layers of socialization that tell us it's not okay to stand up for what we want and need. And so a lot of our own work is unlearning that shit, right? If you have been if you have been socialized at any point in your life as a woman, you I can guarantee that you have had that conditioning that says, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be adapting, you gotta be giving people what they want, you gotta be nice, right? You gotta be kind, you gotta be quiet, you know. That's even before you get to the whole angry black woman thing, right? Which is, which is, you know, what happens whenever you don't meet people's expectations, right? And so it's a learning exercise for us. I think it is absolutely necessary. And sometimes you have to start small. So sometimes starting small looks like 
say no to one thing that does not work for you this week, <laughs> right? Start, start with that. And I guarantee after you've said that first no, you're gonna to want to say no more. No is gonna become, as Lisa says, and others say, no is a full sentence, right? And no is going to become, you're gonna be start, you're just gonna start looking at things, you know, and, and also tune into your intuition. Somebody offered me recently, what looked on the face of it like a really good opportunity. And I was there hemming and hawing and I didn't jump on it immediately. And I'm thinking, eh, what is it that is, you know, what is it that is making me hesitate about this? And I thought, you know, I thought about it. And then eventually I stopped questioning it. And I just said, no, I don't think this is gonna work for me now. Right? I didn't, I did, it was not a hard no closing the door forever. It was more like a no, I'm not feeling it right now. And then, you know, I'm not gonna waste your time, keep you hanging on. And I'm not gonna waste my time thinking about it. If it's for me, it will come back round. If it's not for me, I mean, there's plenty of other stuff out there, right? So, so yes, it's, it, it's essential. And you know, you feel so much better walking and standing in your power by learning the power of a good no. And then, and then the other side of that is asking for what you want and need, right? Like getting paid for your time when you speak, right? And sometimes, you know, people will, People will just shift your perspective on something. I, you know, like a couple of times this year it's happened, but I spoke to people on podcasts and they came back to me and I was just doing it because, you know, I published a book and, you know, I was doing promotion and, you know, and they said, man, you dropped so many gems. I want to pay you. Right. That happened to me already twice this year. And I'm thinking, wait, well, you know, am I missing something here? So, you know, you've got to look out for those signals then that also say it is okay to readjust your expectations as new information comes in. Just because you were not getting paid to speak last year when you had done your first event, doesn't mean that this year when you have done 10 or 15 or 20, you should not be getting paid. And you should be getting paid well, and your time should be valued, right? I think, you know, part of setting boundaries, boundaries don't always have to be, some boundaries are fixed, some boundaries adjust as new information comes in. And we need to allow ourselves that space and grace to work with new information, to change what we, we require as new information comes in, as we become more of what we already are, as we take ourselves out into the world and show up, right? That is something that we need to allow. And it is absolutely essential because we don't wanna be out here feeling exploited and extracted from and reamed and all those kind of things right and you know while you don't necessarily do this for the money you might be doing it for the purpose you might be doing it because it's necessary you know money is an exchange of value in the world we live in however we feel about capitalism that's the world we're in right now and therefore our efforts have to be valued monetarily as well as just in every other way, right? Because I cannot take your exposure to the supermarket and buy food for my actual table, <laughs> okay? I cannot do that, <laughs> right? I need cash. So sometimes it's about the money. You know, we may not, it's not the reason. It's not the reason for doing things. It's not the reason for setting the boundaries, but sometimes the boundaries need to be set to enable us to continue to show up and do the work by having the appropriate value placed on what we're doing. Yes. Thank you, Sharon, so much. Brittany, I'd love to hear from you as well. So I'm thinking about um, everything that I've come to learn about boundaries and how um, sometimes there is a uh, more salient narrative around Black women not having boundaries. Um, and I'm also remembering or reflecting on, prior to the, like, the language of boundaries, the beautiful ways in which I've seen just like Black women show up in service of themselves and their needs. I sometimes talk about what it means to like um, have as part of this reckoning, one's own ancestral board of directors, um, of which mine includes Audre Lorde, right? Who 
I guess before the language of boundaries, reminded us that caring for ourselves is not self-indulgence any more than it is a very deliberate act of political warfare. I'm thinking about how my mom, and as much as she was a teenage mom, was very clear when of her expectations around what you could and couldn't do around her children. You know what I mean? Just like in 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 which could feel like taboo in the in the presence of elders. You know what I mean? And so like how boundaries and as much as there is a lot of um, um, truth um, and narrative around the extent to which we have not been able to lean into them. What beauty, what beauty is it when we're able to um, also lean into how it has shown up, whether it be in those before us um, and, and in our lineage, right? I speak in affirmations. I speak in affirmations. That's like my second love language. Um, and I started to um, affirm for myself daily that I am human, I am divine, I am worthy. If I am human, then I am deserving of care. If I am divine, then I am deserving of love. If I am worthy, then I am deserving of protection. Heavy on the deserving, like that language is so significant. If I am imperfect, then I am deserving of loving accountability. If I am growing and evolving, that I'm deserving of like spaciousness and like cushion to like do that. If all these systems continue to be alive and well, then I can continue to refuse, you know? Um, and when I think about care, love, protection, accountability, cushion and spaciousness, refusal, that's like what boundaries are to me. Um, and a part of just at the intrapersonal level, where it starts for me is knowing that I deserve, you know what I mean? Like that I literally deserve without over explanation, because we live in a world that will absolutely have us out here having to explain every damn thing. Why? How you know? <laughs> no, I deserve just because and it's in me right we talk a lot about I've been processing this whole like you know yes holding space for um generational curses yes holding space for the fact that you know we come from unfortunately a historical context where black women are disrespected and I have so much energy in reimagining and remembering generational gifts and remembering and reimagining Black women as loved and nurtured and cared for and allowed to have boundaries, right? That's what comes up for me when I think about that question, okay? You know, like, allowed, I deserve. What you talking about? <laughs> allowed, we deserve. Yeah. I love how you care for your body. I love how you care for your body. <clears throat> I love how you strive to, I, I, that's, a, that's a love language for me too. Just like, mm, hand over heart, rock. Mm. Breathe. Mm. Thank you for acknowledging so much in this space. And also just, I want y'all to know that I care for my body because nobody else is fucking doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to. Lisa, I would love to hear from you. Okay, wow, so much, so much good, good, good stuff. So many gems shared. And um, huh. so three things come to mind for me. One, the first, of course, is that no is a full sentence, right? Uh, the second, many of you have heard me speak on this and have seen me post about this. The second is free is canceled. And the third one is that 
to me, boundaries are guardrails for joy. So I'll, th I'll say those again. So no is a full sentence. Free is canceled. And boundaries are guardrails for joy. And actually, Brittany, it's interesting that you brought up the word deserving. Because what I what the full sentence that I wrote is boundaries are guardrails for joy because we are deserving. We are deserving by dint of being human and 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 extant and and, and just ex existing. We are deserving of joy, and black women, black people, especially, are. I I think that we need we need a double dose because it has been denied us. It has been denied us for centuries and generations. And so the, the, the bl Black women do need boundaries in order to create a soft, sweet, full, cushiony, luxurious, indulgent life. That for you. Just, just, just hearing about you're like, yeah, yeah. I need some, some softness. I need some cushion, right? Because we have to carry so much day in, day out, and we are so often required to show up like, like literal workforces and just keep doing, just keep producing. And no, <laughs> just no. Those those days are done. So. If we are going to show up in this world as so many of us are, are doing and, and produce and sow so into the world, we have to also pour into ourselves, right? Um, and so saying a no to other people, saying a no to people and situations and experiences that are not in alignment with who you really are, with what your purpose is, with your new goals, uh, saying no to all of that, all the trash. I don't remember who said it. The trash that's taking itself out. Was that, was that you, Kimberly? <laughs> right, right. So when you say no to all of that and the trash takes itself out, guess what? You have a beautiful, new, empty vacuum into which wonderful, loving, nurturing, high vibrational, aligned experiences and people will fall and you don't even have to do anything right nature abhors a vacuum you take out the trash guess what? all the good stuff is literally just going to be attracted to you because you have created room for it by setting those boundaries and saying no um often you know I, many, many things uh can, some things can be thought of i guess in a, in a binary by which I mean, like, like I said, if you say no, say no to one thing, you're saying yes to yourself, right? And giving what beauty is there in just saying that no with a full chest, with a full chest, right? And saying yes to yourself with that gentleness and allowing all of the sweetness of life to just flow toward you. I think it is a beautiful thing. Um, Black women are, it's not, not a matter of being allowed to have boundaries. It's, you know, we are deserving of boundaries. And actually, Rihanna comes to mind, by, by which I mean, well, we all know that she, obviously she did her, her Super Bowl performance. And what, I was just like appalled. I was appalled <laughs> at how people were expecting this pregnant woman to do gymnastics and cartwheels. I don't know what they were expecting, right? But the beauty of Rihanna, she's like, oh, <laughs> well, guess what? Here's what I'm gonna do. Y'all gonna take this little shoulder shake. Y'all gonna take that. Are you gonna love it? And I'm gonna make more money with my Fenty, my little Super Bowl Fenty ad. I'm gonna make more money just doing my shoulder shake. And y'all gonna, y'all gonna enjoy it. That is my boundary. Because I am doing me, I'm doing this performance how I want to do it. And I think that it's a lesson that many of us can uh, take and imp implement and incorporate into our lives in our own way, right? Whatever your Super Bowl performance is, whatever you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, 
um, you get to decide how you want to show up and how you want to do it. And, and really, and do it, and do it happily. Do it happily, right? It's not about, you know, showing up and doubting yourself and no. Get centered, get grounded, say your no, and let the blessings flow towards you. Thank you so much. Everyone here has just, I'm overjoyed and over full and just, I cannot thank y'all enough for every message that was shared here today. And I see the comments. I'm so appreciative of everyone. Unfortunately, I can't read that fast, but thank you so much for sharing. Um, we were gonna have a Q&A at the end of this, but honestly, um, if y'all have questions, pay them. Um, send them money. I'm actually going to drop something in the chat really quick. This is a support page. This will also be sent to y'all via email afterwards. Click the links, the pictures of everybody, and it will show you ways to support the amazing people who have shared so much with y'all today. Um, yeah, so... Have a great rest of your day. I'm going to go lie down for like seven days, probably. Um, just because this has filled me to the brim today. And I, I am at peace right now. So I'm going to go sit in that peace for like seven hours and, and be overjoyed that I know these people and was able to share space with them today. So I hope y'all do the same, not the lie down for seven hours, but just like do what you need to do after this. Um, I love y'all and y'all. Keep setting those boundaries and saying absolutely not to anything unaligned. We'll see you next time. Bye.